All right. Welcome, everybody, to our next installment of mental health, um, our mental health movement. So again, we are welcoming our lovely guest, Ren Van Eyck, um, from the National Farmers Mental Health Alliance. And today we are going to be talking about how real the stress is. So Ren, I'll give it to you. Thank you so much, Shelley. Thank you to Milk Movement for having the vision uh, behind providing these webinars for, uh, for all those that are connected with the agriculture industry. And thankfully, you know, there's lots of consistency between some of the skills that we learn in, in this education and what we can use and utilize in the rest of our world and life and families and uh, communities. So, uh, so especially, I just want to say thank you to Milk Movement for doing this and for Shelly for hosting. Well done. Folks, we're going to talk about stress today. And the title, the title is Stress is Real. I, I think that goes without saying, but the interesting thing that we've come to learn is it's not so much the actual stress, it's how we perceive stress that really can cause the, you know, kind of health consideration. So you're going to see as we go through this, we're going to talk about stress, but we're also going to talk about how we view stress. If we view stress as something that uh, is a body response, right, it, it, it's our body's response to an event, and it's a good thing, right, my heart rate's increasing, my body is primed and ready uh, to address whatever situation is going on, then, then that's actually a healthy form uh, of stress, a healthy way of dealing with it. And, and it doesn't cause the kind of um, health concerns that it does when we go, oh my goodness, there's too much stress. This is my blood pressure is going to go up and it's going to be bad. And I'm going to get sick and all of those things. So it's very interesting to me that so much of how we perceive stress is really the key to unlocking um, how we turn stress that it becomes a motivator and it becomes something that really works in our favor. I think it's fantastic. I'm just going to go ahead and share the screen uh, and then we will jump right into our presentation. For those of you that have joined us before, uh, thank you so much for tuning in again. And um, I do believe that this, uh, our presentation is recorded. So I'm sure you can contact Milk Movement and Shelly will probably summarize at the end uh, so you can share it and make use of the presentation at a later date as well. Okay, so what is stress? A lot of times we go, oh my goodness, I'm so stressed. I'll tell you a little story. I had this little girl who came into my office one time and she's like, I'm so overwhelmed. You know, she was, she was just about seven years old and she had all the drama to go with the stress that she was feeling. She was feeling overwhelmed. And I said, oh my goodness, what, what does that mean? And she says, I, I don't know. You see, oftentimes we feel stress or we feel feelings of being overwhelmed or we feel distraught. We feel all of these emotions, but we often don't take a step back to really understand what that means. So let's get back to the basics here. What is stress? It's a feeling uh, that we have when we feel like we can't cope with pressure. Now, it could be a, a mental pressure right? Where our brains are just having to function and flow in many different areas. Anybody been there where you just feel like, okay, I've got to do this and I've got to do that and I've got to do this. And our, our brains are literally on high demand in many different areas of our life. That's a fairly common experience for many people in our world right now. The other one is the emotional pressure, right? We feel these big feelings when it comes to, you know, we've got a relationship that's strained. And that is an, it's emotionally draining. Sometimes, as you know, I'm a therapist. And so sometimes in sessions after people have shared their very precious story, which I consider a huge privilege when somebody would trust me with their story. At the end of it, we just take some deep breaths because it has been an emotional pressure that has really been kind of sitting on that person. And they have finally found the space that they can safely um, dis discharge it, so to speak. And, and so that too is stress. It's really important that we take the time to say, you know, not all stress is bad. If you think about some stress in your life and some of what you've been experiencing, particularly over the past maybe three or four months, what are some of the stresses that you've had that you would think are not bad? For instance, yesterday I had the absolute privilege of celebrating my granddaughters. Yes, I'm a grandma. I'm an Oma. 
And so for all those other young Omas out there, it's, it's okay. I've learned that it's okay. And I'm thrilled that at the age of 45, um, my daughter and her husband have a little baby girl who turned one yesterday, uh, actually two days ago, but we celebrated yesterday. I gotta be honest with you. There was a little bit of stress around hosting a one-year-old's birthday party because I really wanted it to be so perfect. It meant that I bought some lobster for all of those who are out on the East Coast because we had some lobster dip. I don't know if you've had lobster dip, but you can find the recipe if you text me or message me. I will share it. It is so fabulous. But we had, uh, you know, all sorts of foods, a really pretty charcuterie board. I I made homemade donuts and built a, like a, a little tree out of homemade donuts. But folks, there was stress that went with it. It wasn't bad stress. It was managed. I saw an end in sight. You know, at the end of the day, we sat in those chairs and we're like, whoo, that was a success. That felt good, right? It's linked to excitement. Not all stress is bad. But conversely, not all stress is good, right? Not all stress. When, when stress leads to long-term illness or we have this chronic pattern of stress, and if you've been on Omni, any of our chats before, you will know that farmers experience forms of chronic stress, meaning stress over the long haul. It feels to them like they just never quite get a break from that feeling of stress. It can cause us to become overreactive or defensive. I just want you to take a minute. Remember that time when you were under a lot of stress and you were really short and snappy with somebody who came to you and asked you what the weather was, right? Or something like a really an easy question but the resulting was, excuse me, why would you bother me by asking me about the weather? You know, like that kind of a, that's our defense of our overreactive. That stress that's kind of teetering on the not good stage. Now we usually can function, but we're, it's at a less optimum level. What that means is we can still function. We can get up, we can go and do our job, but we're not meeting our real potential right? We can still function. As a farmer, when I'm under a lot of stress, I can still go out there and do the chores. But my eyes might not be peeled to noticing the you that's in distress. And that has happened before, where later I've gone out and went, oh, shoot, I missed that sign. Because I was already under, you know, a significant amount of stress. So of course we wanna chat about what causes you stress. Now this changes from farmer to farmer. I always find it interesting sometimes when people who, if you step outside of the agriculture community, were kind of branded or thought of in this one, you know, fell swoop. That, oh, corn prices are really good or soybean prices are really good or wheat prices are really good. Therefore, you know, you're getting really good prices for your lambs because we're sheep farmers and that's not the case. So things that might be causing me stress within my commodity or within my industry might not be causing stress for someone else. So it's important that we give some space that we recognize what's causing you stress. For me, relationships with my family are not causing me stress, which is absolutely a huge gift. I love that. I love that I see my kids getting along, but I am not representative of everyone. There's many of you on the call who say, oh my goodness, I've had a falling out with my brother or my sister. And no matter what we do, we just can't kind of mend that relationship. So there's a lot that's beyond our control as farmers and as people in the community, but as farmers specifically, these are some of the things that are causing you stress. For the dairy farmers that are on the call, I just want to take a bit of a deep breath because you have faced some really expensive feed cost rises that is almost, I would say, unprecedented. I could be wrong, but really in my experience, they're pretty unprecedented. For the dairy farmers in BC last year, when the floods rose and you were trying to get your cattle onto higher ground and transported out of the valley, that was some incredible stressful moments. You know, for our American friends that faced the drought this year down through Kansas and the Midwest, ooh, that has been really troubling. I was watching a video uh, and it was a, of this young farmer because it had rained and she was just crying uh, because it had rained. So there's a lot of things that cause stress. I want to just take a minute to kind of review some of these stats. <clears throat> so 76% of farmers experience moderate to high levels of perceived stress. 
just take a deep breath there, 76%. That's for every four farmers, three of them have moderate to high levels of perceived stress. That's a really high statistical number. Uh, farmers in Canada are two times more likely to die by suicide than the general population. Now, I also want to say there that in the U.S., it's actually a higher number. It's between four to six times more likely in the U.S. than the general population. Only 9% of farmers seek support compared to 16% of the rural population. So there's kind of, I'm talking about three different populations here. I want to recognize that those population differences can be um, broken down further than that. But for, for the, we have the general population. And then we have the rural population as far as seeking support. And then we have the farmers seeking support. General population is somewhere around 18 to 24% um, seek seek support. And, and most research is pointing much closer to the 24%. I, it's very hard to find the research at the 18%. That just means that the general population is much more likely to seek out counseling services or mental health support than rural populations. But then of the rural populations, only 9% of farmers seek support, while 16%, so it's almost double the rural population. This really means that farmers are much less likely to seek out counseling support and mental health support when they need it than the general population. 25% of farmers in Canada have thought about taking their own life last year, wish they were dead, they felt their life was not worth living. That's one in four farmers. That's a stark number. Right. And that's where we're at. And stress plays a role in those numbers. Right. Stress plays a role in our desire to say farming is just not worth it anymore. I want to talk really briefly about the different types of stress. And the reason why this is important is because it's critical that we understand the differences between kind of chronic stress and these acute episodes of stress. So type of stress, acute meaning kind of happens once it's event specific. Meaning I went out to the barn today and the sheep had gotten out. A number of them had gotten into the grain. So I was dealing with grain gorge. That's a, a very specific event, right? That's an acute example of, of a type of stress. Episodic acute stress, meaning that happens often. So I go out to the barn and for the fourth time in the past week, the sheep have gotten out and have gotten into the grain. That would be really poor husbandry practices, but you know what I'm saying. I'm kind of giving that as an example. That hasn't happened for real life. <laughs> but it typically means that you're constantly in the sense of rush, right? We're running late. We can only feel more, more disorganized because we're really moving from one episode of stress to another. We're moving from one episode to another. It often means that we take on too many projects and too many responsibilities than what we really are equipped to handle. Now, remember farmers are fixer by nature. We also like to say yes a lot. When somebody needs something, we like to say yes a lot. So we can easily fall into this category where we bounce from one stressful event to the other, to the other, to the other. Now, sometimes it's important for us to understand that it can be beyond our control, right? How many of you have noticed we go from a flood to a drought? You know, we go from commodity prices that are cycling high to low to high to low. So we can, we can lose a lot of money really quickly and we can gain a lot of money really quickly. So it's not always within our control. The last one is that chronic stress. It's that consistent feeling of being pressured. And it does turn to feelings of hopelessness and helplessness. Vessel, Vessel van der Klok wrote this book called The Body Keeps the Score. And the picture is a little bit fuzzy. I don't know if you can really see it, but... It really just talks about the stress's impact on our, on our health, meaning our body keeps the score. I often tell the story of my brother and sister-in-law. If you've been on any of our previous conversations, you've probably heard the story. But their son, Mikhail, who was an incredible young little boy at the age of four and a half, died. He had what's called invasive group A strep pneumonia. And that's basically the fleshy new disease that landed in his lungs. And it looked like he had a cold, but then he didn't wake up and he died in his sleep. What my sister-in-law will tell you is that afterwards, after he died, her body would physically ache. Her muscles in her arms would physically ache, you know, longing to hold him again. But really it's trauma that has muscle memory. And so even, you know, now, seven years later, 
Uh, around January 23rd is the anniversary date of his death. Her arms will still hurt. Her body will still hurt because that trauma is scored and kept in the body. And so remember that while stress's initial impact, right, your initial impact is actually a physical response. And so for you farmers that are on the call, understanding that stress and that physical response of your body is your body does keep the score. Uh, impact of chronic stress. I'm sure you probably all have heard me say this before, but anxiety and depression, they're like two peas in a pod. When one goes walking, the other one follows closely behind. If you experience anxiety, which is another word for it is worry, uh, but a, a much stronger, you know, having like, oh, I'm worried my cake won't turn out is very different than an anxiety, but most people are pretty comfortable with the word worry. So anxiety is this feeling of dread sometimes. Sometimes it's worried that nothing will turn out. Sometimes we're worried about rejection, all different things. And when we get tired of worrying all the time, depression and sadness sneak in because we're just tired of worrying. We don't enjoy life. And so we become sad because we're always worried. And with that depression, anxiety typically gets worse because then we become worried we're depressed or we're worried we're going to get more sad. And then, the, which increases our anxiety, which means the depression, the sadness feelings gets worse. It actually then leads to relationship breakdown or, or physical illness, right? Which then makes our worry worse. We are now worried we're going to be physically ill. And that physical illness leads to relationship breakdown, grows the depression. It's this chronic cycle, unfortunately. Now, the real reason, the real, the real answer to this dilemma is to target that anxiety and depression. We want to break up that relationship between the two and really target anxiety. So what do we do about it, folks? We want to talk about resilience resilience is the key. Now, interesting enough, I find this uh, pretty cool, not cool in a, a great way, but uh, maybe another word to say it is informatively shocking. <laughs> uh, recently, there was a research report that came out of University of Guelph that scored farmers' resilience abilities quite a bit lower than the general population. Now, resilience is your ability to kind of bounce back. Understanding that when we're talking about mental health, we're not looking to bounce back to where we were before. We're looking to gain skills to kind of accomplish new goals. But our resilient skills were really quite low as farmers, which surprises me because farmers are fixers by nature and they like to take care of problems. What we know is that farmers are very resilient. Because you would not be able to be a farmer and go through the trials that we go through without being resilient. When you think about the floods and the, you know, input costs and pouring your life's work into growing um, and harvesting only to find out that the, the commodity price has dropped. But what we do know is those skills that we are really good at, as far as resilience on the farm, we have difficulty flipping that into a mental wellness resilience. Right. So some of those skills, we just need to learn to transfer them. <clears throat> so in order to build that resilience, we need to change our thinking around things. Now, remember, I talked about stress and it's not so much the actual stress. It's the perception of stress. So when you feel the stress response, it's time to change your thinking. When you feel your heart rate increasing, your respirations increasing, the feeling like the fogginess is starting to sink in in your brain because the stress is impacting your ability to make decisions, we need to take a deep breath and say, okay, wait a minute, my heart rate's actually increasing because my body is getting prepared to fight effectively. We're going to respond effectively. My body's doing what it needs to do in order to address stress. I've done it before. I can do it again. And then oxytocin that I feel, that heart rate increase, it actually helps rejuvenate my heart cells. So when we change our thinking about stress, and when we choose to say, no, no, wait a minute, this stress response is my body's response, it changes the trajectory of the outcome of stress. So we have to learn to kind of change our perception and change our response when it comes to stress. Uh, there's a, a lady, if you go on any of those TED Talks, Kelly McDonald, I, I think it is, McDonald, uh, she does a really great TED Talk on stress. And uh, it's really quite 
startling the statistics that have come out of it was Harvard that was some of the lead uh, researchers on it and and the impact of stress rather than the perception of stress uh, was really quite startling. In order to get to this place, we've got to learn to figure out what I'm actually feeling. And if you're a farmer on the call, I, I hate to tell you this, but we're not very good at this. We're really good at lifting up that rug and sweeping things under the rug and hoping that it will just go away. We're not very good at, at taking a step back and saying, what am I really feeling? What's really going on? We're typically afraid of the feelings of being vulnerable. That means we're afraid to be scared, which is interesting because we're actually afraid. We are scared. That's okay to be. That's a basic emotion. In fact, everybody in this world at some point has felt scared. So there's four basic emotions. The first one there that you see that little emoji is mad. And then we go to sad. And then we go to scared. And then we go to glad. So mad, sad, glad, and scared. Those are the four basic emotions. And the next time you feel that stress response, your goal is to take a deep breath. and say, what am I really feeling? What's really going on? And if you're mad, take another breath because behind mad, mad is actually a secondary emotion. Behind mad, it's typically sad or scared. It's okay to be scared and it's okay to be sad. I was thinking of this time in my own life where after one of my children were married, I was driving from my house. I left my house all happy-go-lucky. Woo, everything's right in the world. And by the time I got to my parents' house, which is about a 20-minute drive, I was really mad at one of my kids. And I thought, why am I mad? What's really going on? And I, I quickly realized I wasn't mad at them. I was sad and I was scared. I was sad because our relationship had changed. They had grown up and made some different decisions of their own, you know, gotten married. I was sad because I valued our relationship so much and it had changed pretty abruptly in some ways, right? Uh, and then I was also scared. I was scared that it meant I wouldn't see them as much. I was scared of Christmases that they wouldn't come home to visit. I was scared of, of missing them. And so you see behind that anger is actually sad and scared. So what is resilience? We kind of danced a little bit around it. I'm going to show you uh, a quick, two quick videos. I, I hope you have time for this. I hope it's okay with, uh, with, with y'all. I want you to kind of try to help me understand the difference between the two. Now it's not to put down the company at all who's put out these videos, but it's important we understand the difference be behind resilience. Hope. It's a hard thing to hold on to in the face of adversity. But this, this is your dream. It's where you belong. It's how you build your legacy. No, it's not going to be easy. But if you want it, if you really want it, you have to work for it. Stop at nothing. No one or anything can hold you back. If you want something this bad, put your boots back on. Keep moving forward. Prove to yourself, no, prove to the world, you have what it takes. Accept the late nights, the early mornings. Push through the rain, the droughts, the market. Learn from your failures. Build on your victories. Keep the faith. Farming, it's selfless, it's difficult, but it's what you were born to do. This isn't some nine to five, clock out, see you tomorrow occupation. It's a get knocked down, play in the mud, love my job type of occupation. It takes heart to be a farmer. So the next time you feel defeated, don't forget. That grit, that determination, it got you here. Your faith, it's your compass. Remember, you were made for this. I want to switch to this uh, quick story. I'm going to fast forward a bit. Again, I'm looking for us to recognize the difference of what resilience really does look like. It um, started off in life feeling uh, pretty, pretty flash about myself, but uh, when I got to about 40, I uh, dived into the uh, dark pit 
we had eight years of drought. No matter what I did on the farm, it was unsuccessful. And I had um, no, no idea of how I could help. How did you know that you were falling into depression? I didn't know that I suffered from depression. I just knew that I'd gone from being a, um, a person who was uh, popular and happy to a person who was angry and bitter. How do you um, reach out for help? Um, in my case, help reached out to me uh, in the form of a, um, a young uh, sales rep and he uh, invited me to uh, attend a field day in North Canterbury. And uh, a guy called Dr. Derek Moot is talking on Lucid. Within five minutes of that man opening his mouth, I was asking people for a pen and paper and feverishly writing down stuff. We got home quite late and I went onto the computer to try to figure out how we could get it to go. And my wife came out and said, what the hell are you doing? And I said to her, I'm, Starting a new dream starts tonight here. Hope. Hope. But I could see that there was a, an opportunity to do something, but I guess it came down to I finally accepted that I needed to change. So what sort of help did you seek? Um, I had a, a very good friend uh, close by here, and him and I were both feeling the stress, but he was a person that I could talk to, and we sometimes used to get together and sit on a hill and share our... Um, our, our, our feelings a bit. What was softening from your point of view? Softening for me was accepting help, inviting other people to rejoin my life. When I softened my attitude and softened my arteries, um, my whole life started to function again. I saw people who uh, came and helped us right across the spectrum of my life, really, um, primarily in farming. That was the bit that had been too tough for me to take my employer a mentor to keep me thinking straight and um i employ people into my life all the time i'm terrified of the isolated place that i went to in the past so i'm now really a collaborator you'll never i'm gonna kind of cut that short i just want to make sure we're able to get through what we want to get through but i hope you heard the difference between the two a lot of times the message that farmers are getting are to put your boots back on now, I, I got to tell you that that's not the message I have for you. The, the message I have for you is the second one. I stayed away from that isolated place. I called in extra help. I employed people who could keep me on the straight and narrow. I met with a friend and I talked with him. Folks, that's resilience. That's the key to thriving again when we have found ourselves in a pretty dark place. That's resilience, the second one. I uh, Sometimes when I speak, you know, on a more national level at a larger conference, I, I'll ask for a few volunteers from the audience. And I was speaking recently to a group of young people. So they are between the ages of 18 to 25. And I asked who had a pair of, um, of Doc Martens on or Blundstones. And if you own a pair of those boots, you'll know they come with a little boot strap pull at the back of those boots. And each of those students sat down on the floor and then I said, okay, now pull yourself up by your bootstraps. It's impossible. In fact, if you've ever been stuck in the mud before in the manure pit, like I have, and you've got rubber boots on, you, you cannot get out of that pit without someone else either joining you in a way or helping to loosen. Sometimes you have to get a shovel and almost create an air pocket underneath that boot. That's the reality behind resilience. We cannot pull ourselves up by the bootstraps. We need to ask for help. And that is the story of resilience. All right, we're going to move along here to some practical coping strategies, because if you know anything about me, you know, I like you to walk away with a tool in your tool belt. Um, talking about mental health and talking about stress is one thing, but walking away with something to really address it that kind of brings on a whole nother level in my opinion. So number one, um, I use the, this REST acronym. And the REST acronym, the number one is the R, right? So it's relax. Number two is evaluate. Number three 
is set an intention. And number four is take action. So rest does not mean that you go and have a nap and pretend that everything is right with the world. It also does not mean that we go and drink a couple of tall boys so we don't have to deal with the reality. And unfortunately, within our agriculture community, that tends to be how we handle some stress, but it's really an unhelpful strategy. Relax means don't act impulsively. All too often, we're more likely to act impulsively. In fact, within the farmer DNA, which I find fascinating, we're, more, we're actually wired to act more impulsively than the general population. Is that not kind of awesome? I think it's one of the reasons why we are quite good at problem solving when, when a stress hits and we're able to say, okay, this is what's happening. But not acting impulsively, when we're facing stress, we got to pull ourselves back and say, okay, wait a minute, can I get a different perspective from this? I'm feeling this way. Let me take a bit of a deep breath and then evaluate the situation. What's really happening? What are the facts? We do this quick evaluation of what's really going on. Because sometimes we want to operate out of our emotional mind. So we have a logical mind. That's those of you who are really great in math, sciences, computers, that very logical piece of you. And then we have an emotional mind. Those are people who are typically a little bit more on the creative side of life and, um, you know, are really good in, in some of the more humanities kind of thing. The wise mind means we blend those two. It means we don't operate solely out of that logical mind. So for those of you who see black and white, it does mean we need to see a little bit of gray. We also don't always operate out of that emotion where we let emotion drive us and we make our decisions solely based on how we're feeling. We want to evaluate things so we can make our decisions out of our wise piece of our mind. So lastly, we set an, not lastly, sorry, we set an intention, set a target goal, a plan, pick a coping skill. So I've included the deep breathing. I'm gonna walk you through deep breathing. I know if you've been on this call before, you have probably done this with me before. I hope you can kind of bear with me as we do it again, because it's such a critical skill that we often brush over. So I always encourage people to put their feet flat on the floor, shoulders up to their ears, let them drop, right? And then we're gonna breathe in through our nose for four seconds, and then we're gonna hold it for four seconds, and we're gonna breathe out through our mouth for four seconds, and then we're gonna hold it for four seconds, okay? So shoulders up, let them drop, sit into your saddle or slouch a little bit. One, two, three, breathe in and hold, breathe out and hold. Okay, if you can't do it for the whole four seconds, you can shrink it back to three seconds or whatever you can do. That is a really good coping skill. When you are faced with this immediate kind of stress response, we want to relax. We're not going to act impulsively. We're going to evaluate the facts. Okay, wait a minute. What's really going on? How am I impacted? What has been said? How do I feel? Okay, let me take a deep breath to process this. And then what's my one next step? And take that action in a mindful way, in an intentional way, rather than this over-the-top kind of experience. Folks, when we talk about coping strategies, it's impossible to talk about them without mentioning that word exercise. It really is the most effective way to get rid of cortisol. Now, if you remember any of our chats on cortisol, that's the stress hormone that's produced. Stress is produ or stress produces is the cortisol uh, hormone, and it comes up over our brain and covers this front portion of the brain. And the front portion of the brain is where we problem solve. It's where we evaluate. It's where we, you know, do our pros and our cons, all of that thinking and deciding mechanisms are done in that prefrontal cortex, that front part of the brain. But cortisol kind of covers that up. It takes away the ability for our brain to do the hard work. So we've got to learn to get rid of it. Now there's four really effective ways or four effective ways of getting rid of cortisol. The last one I don't put up because while it's effective to get rid of cortisol, it turns into an unhealthy coping skill. So the first one is exercise. That means both planned exercise. So I'm getting up, I'm gonna go for a walk for 20 minutes. I've been really trying to do that myself. The other one is impromptu. When your buddy calls you on the weekend and says, hey, let's go for a hike or let's go and you know, hunt something or whatever is within your realm. Um, then that would be the exercise coping strategy. 
Number two is time with people and time away with people. So sometimes it's maybe just time away with that one person. Uh, but the other one is time with people. So when you get together and you have a gathering and you have social interaction, that's actually a really effective way to get rid of cortisol. It's one of the reasons why the pandemic impacted us so much when it comes to the feelings of stress and why many of us were resulting to drinking alcohol um, early on in the pandemic. The third one is an ugly cry. Now I gotta be honest with you, an ugly cry really does look ugly. If you, I'm not sure if anybody is in a chat box session there, you throw up a picture of an ugly cry, a GIF or something. I'm always curious because we have sometimes a little bit of competition between what the ugliest cry really looks like. Um, I, if you think about an ugly cry, do you think it's just one little tear streaming down the side of a cheek? Yeah, you know, would you consider that an ugly cry? No, I agree. Shelly's shaking her head. She's like, no, that's not ugly. I can show you, <laughs> right? Like an ugly cry is we are red and we are puffy and their goobers are flowing everywhere. And when we speak, the saliva sticks to the bottom of the mouth and the roof of our mouth at the same time, that is an ugly cry. The last one is probably a personal favorite and much to my chagrin, is carbohydrates. Now, if I were to ask you how many cookies do you think you'd have to eat in order to get a release of cortisol, how many cookies do you think that would be? Any guess? Oh, Shelly says one cookie, close. Or do you mean one bag of cookies? <laughs> Most people are like, I need the whole bag, right? No, it's actually half a cookie. So if you can take that cookie and you can bite it and then set it down and walk away, carbohydrates are your game. It's your go-to. But for many of us, it kind of turns into, oh, that feels so good. That tastes so good. I'm going to have another one and another one and another one. And before you know it, we've had half the bag. Um, and so we've actually increased our unhealthy coping strategies. All right. One of the other ways to deal with stress is we have to learn to deal with this thing called unhelpful guilt and letting go of perfectionism. This means I'm probably going to step on a few toes today. Because if you're a farmer, you are more programmed for perfectionism than what we like to admit. And in another slide or two, you're going to see I talk about breaking up with um, with uh, kind of false humility as well. Eek, I know I'm stepping on toes. I hope that's okay. Okay, first of all, unhelpful guilt, folks. Unhelpful guilt means we have set unrealistically high expectations for ourselves and often for others around us. And that stems from a desire to please an adult early in life, usually is established between the ages of three and six years of age, right? And it's not always apparent. I know a lot of people are like, oh, I don't want to go to counseling because they're going to want me to talk about my relationship with my mom and dad and blah, blah, blah. You know, I, I get that. It might be a, a coach. It might be a teacher. It might be somebody else. It might have been a parent that you loved and you wanted to please. And so you worked really hard to please them. But no matter what, just felt like you just never quite reached that mark. Folks, that's unhelpful guilt. And it actually is ripening of an area for anxiety to grow. It's anxiety that pushes us and pushes us and pushes us to try and meet these unrealistic expectations that we'll never reach, right? We'll never actually ever kind of reach them quite high enough. So we've got to learn to break up with unhelpful guilt. It's just not helpful. In fact, a lot of times I'll say to somebody, is self-criticism ever really helpful? And I know for a lot of people on the call, if you're kind of like, well, no, it's really good. No, no, I'm talking self-criticism, not self-reflection. Self-reflection, very helpful. Yeah, there's a job. I could have done this differently, right? That's self-reflection. That grows us. That allows us to say, what did I like about something I did? What did I not like? How can I grow my like and get away from some of my not like? That's okay. Self-criticism is this. Oh, well, you should have done better. How could you have failed like that? You just completely dropped the ball. That's self-criticism. And that's generally, I've never heard of it being truly helpful. Be aware of that negative self-talk. Practice self-compassion. Now, a lot of times people are like, oh, self-compassion, that just grows your own self-absorbedness. No, no, no. 
Self-compassion grows your compassion for other people as well, right? If you can show yourself some grace when you screw up, it means you can have compassion on other people. Self-compassion is an incredible tool in your belt. Take the time to examine whether your goals and expectations are actually attainable. Break down those goals into smaller steps. And then the last piece of that is establishing and examining those irrational fears, those ones that, you know, put you at odds with the idea of accepting help from somebody else or going to see, um, going to see a therapist or says, no, I'm not even going to try for this because it's just this crazy fear. The next piece I want to chat about is learning to be kind to yourself. Ooh. I reckon this is not farming language for most, most of you. If you're a farmer, you're on the call, you're kind of like, seriously, Loren? No, 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 wait, wait, wait. You think about when you're in the barn and who you're talking to. More than often than not, we're talking to ourselves. We're talking about what we could have done differently or what we should have done. I don't like that word should. It generally just tells me I'm a failure. Could is much better. Remember that you'll never talk to anybody else in your life more than you talk to yourself. So to be kind to yourself, because that's where growth happens. That's actually, it's a good thing. Remind yourself, how would you, you know, talk to yourself the way you'd want somebody else to talk to you? Okay, I want to jump into mindfulness. It's also a coping strategy. Now, mindfulness for all those people on the call that think it's just frou-frou and kind of like out there. It is simply paying attention on purpose, right? It's really just noticing things. So when I go out to the barn and I'm like watching the sheep do a sheep race, those lambs that run behind their mamas when they, they go back and forth and back and forth, that's being mindful. In the wintertime, if I take this deep breath and I exhale it and I watch my breath as it dissipates, that's being mindful. If I go to the field and I pick some alfalfa and I taste it or I smell it or I notice how it feels in my hands, that's being mindful. That's slowing down so we can pay attention on purpose. That act in and of itself is a huge stress reliever. It's just learning to pay attention, slow down and notice the things around you. All righty. I want to chat real quick. I, I don't know if we have time to kind of get through all of these slides and all of these strategies, but we're going to kind of try. Um, if there's any questions, Shelly, feel free to kind of throw it up in the chat box or unmute yourself and let me know, Shelly, if there's some questions going on or comments that you want me to be aware of. Folks, we're going to do a grounding exercise together because in my opinion, this is one of the really key things to do when we're feeling overwhelmed, when stress is really bothering us when we're perceiving it like, ah, and when we want to be resilient, we've got to learn how to slow things down. Anxiety is future-based. If you stop and think for just a minute about the things that you're worried about, are they happening in the here, the right now? Are these things happening? No, they're future-based. Anxiety operates in the future, not in the present. And oftentimes we get wrapped up. If this happens, then this will happen. Then this will happen before you know it. We've got 50 years of crises down the road that we're trying to solve when they're not here in the right now. So we've got to learn how to focus on the right now. So just throw it up in the chat box there or on the message. What are five things that you can see with your, with your eyes right now? Just step back and look. What are five things that you can see? I can see glasses. I can see pictures. I can see a TV. I can see some I think seagulls, pelicans, statue thingy over there. Uh, and I can see a giant elephant plant. Those are five things I can see. So just with your eyes, five things you can see. Once you've done the five things you can see, what are four things that you can touch? Okay, four things that you can touch. So for me, it's my glasses. Please note, I am going to pick up my new glasses today. So I won't be the one armed glass wearing presenter any longer. I will have to shed that title, but I can touch them. So there is something that I can feel and touch. I can touch my watch. I can play with the ring on my finger. My feet are on the floor. My bottom's in my seat. 
if my hair was down, I could play with that. Those are four things that I can touch. So five things you can see, four things you can touch. Now, what are three things you can hear? I'm obviously one of the answers to that question. I can hear myself, right? What else can you hear? The hum of a computer? Maybe some traffic going by? Is there some people talking in the office next to you? Is your roommate throwing something around behind you? Something like that. Is there some craziness going on, right? Shelly's got her kids upstairs, the clicking of the keyboard, the computer and the dryer. Okay, so we did five things you can see, four things you can touch, three things you can hear. What are two things you can smell? Now, this is when you can lose all sense of, of, of being bashful and you can give yourself the old fashioned stiff test. Now, I'm always hopeful that it's something pleasant, um, like you've got deodorant on today. That would be lovely. You're wearing some perfume. Maybe you can smell your shampoo. Maybe there's some wood burning in the fireplace or something. Ah, wood stove. That's what Shelly's got, right? So two things you can smell. And lastly, we want to do one thing we can taste. So five things you can see, four things you can touch, three things you can hear, two things you can smell, one thing you can taste. Now, it's okay if it's just your own spit. That's totally fine. I'm always hopeful that it's good tasting spit if it needs to be. But one thing you'll notice is sometimes when people have an anxiety, kind of a panic attack is what we call them, they'll taste metal or salt in their mouth. Um, so that's, that's actually kind of an indication for you to say, oh, wait a minute, I've got that metallic taste or I've got that salty taste in my mouth. You know, it means that I need to do this practice a couple of times because anxiety is in charge right now. And I don't, I don't want it to be, I'm, I can be in charge and I don't need anxiety to be in charge. Great job. There you are folks. Okay, boundaries. This is one that we were just chatting about before we got on the call because boundaries are so important, really important. We're not very good at setting them and we're terrible at enforcing them. Uh, a long time ago, you know, somebody said to me, well, what type of boundary is this? And so there is pictures of kind of a dam that had some holes in it, right? And that's not a really good boundary because eventually that water is going to wear away and burst open that dam. And other people had these rocks that they had assembled, but the, that rock kind of fence was really low. People could easily kind of hop over it. And so even sometimes with really firm boundaries, if we don't do a proper job enforcing them, they're not followed. So I, I always start off this kind of conversation with fences. Why do we have fences? Is it just to keep some things in or is it to keep other people out? What? right? If you think about your backyard, do you have a fence in your backyard? Why would you have a fence? I can tell you from my perspective, it's because I like to keep my sheep in, right? I like, I don't like them on the road and I like to keep coyotes and other nuisance dogs out. That's my goal between my electric fence. Shelly, I know you've heard the story before, so I hope it's not common knowledge to everybody. I hope it's kind of still a funny story for folks, but I had this lady show up at my door one time and she thrust out her arm and she had this long red line right down her arm. And I said to her, I knew exactly what had happened right away. Can anybody guess what type of fence I have around my property? The type that leaves burn marks on your arm because it's an electric fence. And it was, it's good for 500 acres. And that particular morning, it was operating on about eight acres. And we had turned it down. We had turned it back to half charge, which was a good thing. Because otherwise, she would have ended up in the ditch rather than just having a red mark on her arm. I shouldn't say burn. It's not really a burn. It just it leaves kind of a... I don't know if it's even a welt. I'm not sure exactly how to explain it. But uh, anyway, she showed it to me and I said, could you tell me why you tried to go through my electric fence? And she said, well, I saw some I, I saw some lambs in the front pasture. I wanted to take some pictures of them. And I said, well, that's great. Now that you've came and you've asked permission, right? Asking permission is a huge thing. And you recognize that there's a boundary there for a reason. I'll be happy to take you to the front yard so you can you know, feed those lambs. That's the reality behind boundary setting. It's not just to keep some things in and other people out. It's also to force the person on the other side of the fence to get the skills they need to thrive in relationship. And for this lady, it meant she had to get the skill of asking permission and recognizing there is a boundary there for a reason. So that's one of the really important things in setting boundaries. 
Now, if you think about your own life and how to apply those boundaries, can be applied to, to many things, to your faith and to your religion, to your uh, family and your expectations around family, to money, to time spent, to the things you say yes or no to. Now, as farmers, we typically say yes a lot. You know, very rarely, if, if we're going to do something, we're like, yep, yep, we can help. We want to help. We are fixers by nature. But sometimes that leaves us vulnerable to not setting boundaries to ensure that other people are asked and other people participate. And so that's part of what setting those boundaries is all about. All right, folks, we're getting kind of close to the end here. Let's try and get through uh, changing the narrative. We want to limit rumination. Anybody know what rumination is? I obviously am a sheep farmer, so, and you guys are all involved in cattle, so you would know what rumination is, right? When a cow, it's it's very, it's actually controversial. I was talking with some veterinarians and I said, because cattle have four stomachs, right? And they didn't respond at all. And I was like, ooh, you know, and sure enough, I had stepped in my own pile of whatever, because because one far, one veterinarian finally put up his hand and said, it's actually really controversial. And I was like, oh, no, is it? Oh, dear. So, folks, the big and long story of it is, of course, a cow will eat hay or grasses and will do a little bit of business there. And then it comes back up into their, their mouths and we call it chewing their cud, right? And they try to digest it again, goes to a second chamber, comes back out, goes to a third chamber, fourth chamber and out. The long story short of that is we do that with our thought life a lot. We regurgitate it and we think on it and we think we've settled the dilemma and then we, we've we swept it under the rug for a while only for it to come back up and there we go. We regurgitate, we ruminate on it again and again and again. We have to learn to change that narrative. We have to learn not to take in too much junk. That means the people sometimes you spend time with, you might want to rethink spending so much time with them. Because sometimes the people around us, we don't realize it, but their stuff becomes our junk. And we, we have to be aware of that. I also want to encourage you to, to look to the river and not the rocks. Any of you ever been to the ocean? Uh, my husband's from Prince Edward Island, which I, is so close to my heart. I absolutely love the island. And sometimes on the North Shore, I, you look out and it's just beautiful. But as you try to wade out into the water, if you look down, you see all sorts of rocks and you miss the beauty of the ocean beyond because I'm looking at the rocks and I'm thinking this is going to hurt, right? It's important that we learn to see the ocean, to see what's beyond these hardships and these difficult times. We've got to change the narrative in that way because we want to see the ocean and the beauty that's beyond and the river that's beyond and not stay fixated in this these rocks in the shallow end, this, this passing through period. I do encourage people to tell good stories about the people around you. If you work in a, an environment where everybody is telling nasty stories about other people on the office team, it is a really poisonous work environment. And so I encourage you to be a changer even today, a, a, a story changer in your office or in your community or in your family. Tell the good stories about the people around you. Rejoice in the things that people rejoice in. Uh, expect setbacks. They certainly do happen. Absolutely, they happen. We're pretty well out of time here. Self-care, it means you're taking care of your own health. You take a responsible uh, responsibility in protecting your own well-being. It does encompass many different areas of life. And we will do this self-care piece another time, folks. Um, it is really kind of an evaluation of self-care. I don't think maybe we, do we have time to go back to it? Do you think Shelly? Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you want to get out your phones and just take a little snapshot of that, that's a, a little evaluation that was created by someone other than myself. And I don't have the author's name, uh, but basically you go through each of those criteria and you mark them between a zero and a three, a three being, yep, I do this all the time, a zero being I never do this. So eating regularly nutritious food, if you like to go to a fast food restaurant change chain and you eat there once a day and that's all you eat, that would probably you would score that at like a zero, right? Because you're really, you know, maybe one depends on what you're ordering at that fast food chain. I don't know. 
if you're like, you know what, I like to try new foods. I like a well-balanced diet. I eat a healthy breakfast and I, you know, and I'm doing all those things, you would score that at closer to a three. Uh, taking day trips, vacations, that was harder during COVID, but uh, do you get a chance to get away? That, that would be a question of self-care. Self-care is more than just kind of yourself, right? Self-care involves sometimes doing the hard things even in life in order to, to feel that accomplishment afterwards. So it, it encompasses your work. It encompasses your uh, relationships with other people. It encompasses your finances. Dare I tip my toe into those financial chasms? Uh, and then of your faith area as well. I think I covered, there's five of them. I think I covered them all, but self-care goes into those different um, areas. Psycho the, your uh, psychological makeup as well, which is kind of the second category here, personal therapy. That can look like, it doesn't have to be talk therapy. It doesn't have to be psychotherapy. It could be other types of therapy that you're making use of. That is self-care as well. Well, folks, that is that quick evaluation. <clears throat> We're going to jump on. So there's your summary, what we do about it. We want healthy coping strategies. We want to let go of perfectionism, engage in mindfulness and participate in self-care. That brings us to the end. I'm going to stop sharing and feel free um, to ask some questions through Shelly. I, I know she's kind of monitoring the, the Q&A section uh, as well as I think the LinkedIn. I'm not sure, Shelly, if you're on both format, both streaming. Awesome. So such an incredible multitasker. Well done, well done. Um, there you have it, folks. Stress, it is real. We do need to change what we how we think about it. Any questions or comments at all? Ren, I have a quick question. Um, I think I told the story before about how I actually met you in the first place. And I saw you speak at an event, at a producer event. Huh? And I recognized that what you were talking about you know, is, is not talked about and it's controversial sometimes. And I, but I, what I did is I wasn't paying attention to you, but I was paying attention to the people around me, you know, all these farmers around me. And I saw a lot of this, uh -huh. but then as we talked, I saw a lot of people looking aside to see how other people are responding. And I saw a lot yeah. of like, yeah, yes, yes, I'm dealing with this. And what I love about you, Ren, is that you normalize all of this for farmers and for people that are producing food and, you know, can like giving their lives to produce food for other people. Um, so what I want, and, and you've done a really good job of highlighting, you know, all of the issues that come with that and describing how that happens, but Ren, how do we normalize this? Like, you know, as far as I'm concerned, agriculture is the most important industry in the world, right? Absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah. Because we feed people, the, these farmers feed everybody in the world. Um, so how do we support people who are dealing with these like hidden pressures as consumers um, that, that literally allow us to live? Like how do we support these people who are going through these absolutely ridiculous pressures in life? You know, I... I, so I'm so thankful that you bring it up to, to normalize it. The reason for that is because uh, our population in the world is growing astronomically. The pressure on farmers to produce food is increasing. In fact, if you look at the literature, most of the literature that's coming out is how can we um, utilize women in, in impoverished countries to grow more food? So it, I, I, to be honest with you, there's a piece of me that feels so badly because there's an increase in expectation on already some really vulnerable populations, including from a mental health perspective, farmers in general. Now, as I said, farmers are fixer by nature and we are resilient people. The, the way to normalize it is simply by having these conversations, right? It's to, and to appreciate the fact that, wow, you know, life isn't peaches, skittles and sunshine for farmers. I, I was talking to a person in, in the industry and of course I was saying, oh, you know, I work primarily with farmers and, and their comment was like, what do you mean you work with farmers? Like, why would they need therapy? <laughs> I was like, whoa. And so they went on to explain that farmers really only work twice a year at planting and at harvesting and they're really wealthy and therefore they shouldn't have any mental health, um, you know, concerns. And so it was a great opportunity for me to normalize the conversation, as you said. And I think 
I think the more that we have these conversations, number one is very helpful. And the more that people within the industry step back and say, wow, you know, thank you for what you do. Anytime we can bridge the gap between the producer and the consumer, which is really what Milk Movement is doing, right? Like that's part of the, the all overall goal and easing the strain that farmers experience and is recognizing what they contribute. Anytime we do that, we further the conversation and we, we take away some of that expectation because really what some farmers feel is that there's an expectation on them to perform and perform and perform no matter what the circumstance and to do it with a happy heart and a smile on their face. And that's just not the reality of what the world um, of, of, of what the world is to what it is for farmers anyway. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, wait to dive into this again in two weeks, is it? I think, or maybe after. Oh, uh, I think we have a bit of a break over Christmas. I think January 9th, for some reason, is ringing a bell. I could have the wrong date though. So, so somebody can jump on and correct me. I should always bring, should. I use the word should. Shelly, what am I thinking? <laughs> thank you, Brennan. This has been amazing. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody who has been on this call and who's going to watch this call moving forward. Um, the more people we can involve in this conversation, the better. Awesome. Thank you, Shelly. Thank you, Milk Movement. Bye-bye.